Having a Gas is the podcast that talks the great and the good of the creative industries, and in particular finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for dancing to, for cooking to, for f***ing to, and more. Today I'm having a gas with Tim Cook, a creative director at MNC Saatchi Berlin. I was excited to talk to Tim because we have a lot of common ground. We both love music and we both love native instruments where Tim worked as a marketing manager. So I grilled him about that and more. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. It's been a it's been, it's been a while, right? It's been a long time coming. What this one? Yeah, this I one. think it was it was in the tank for December, wasn't it? What was yeah. your December like? Flying to London and getting locked down. Uh, well, I, I I flew back to Lancashire because um, oh, that's because that's where I'm from originally. Hence the the accent. Um, and uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't too bad, you know. Uh, getting in was okay. Um, and then I, I worked from home for a couple of days, um, and then it was basically vacation for yep. the rest of the time. Yeah. So I had like a good three or four weeks there. Um, but then coming back was just like, <laughs> it was crazy. Like in London, they had this whole like variant of COVID and blah, 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 blah. So yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was nuts coming back. And there was people with like residence permits who weren't being allowed to get on flights. So yeah. Yeah. And it was weird for you as well, I imagine from, I don't imagine it's that significant and I don't want to bore everyone with, with the Brexit thing, because I think I think we're all sick of it now. But uh, you, you flew out of the EU as a sort of as a you know friend, as a citizen, not quite, yeah. but almost. And yeah. then when you flew back to work, uh, the deal was done and it was all over. Yeah, exactly. So it was. I mean, it wasn't too too bad. Um, Berlin, and especially like for for the people who've been here for a while, um, I think quite a lot of us got stamps in our passport uh, that were like residents here. So that was kind of okay to get back in, but there was, you know, four or five people in front of me on the same flight and they had basically um, printouts of their residence permits or whatever. Um, and the airline were like, no, we've been told we can't, we can't allow you to come on. Like we need to have the official uh, documents. We need to see like stamps and stuff. I thought, God, at least, at least it didn't happen to me, but uh, yeah, it was crazy. Did you see any of those uh, ads made by Mullen Lowe last year where it was all, this kind of pseudo optimistic. Check the guidance. Make the changes. Let's go. It's, it's Brexit Britain. It's a was new it era. Moulin Law. I, yeah. I I remember that and like it was. Is that is that is that the one where they're all walking through factories and yeah. things like that? And you're just like, this seems awfully like optimistic. And yes. now you know, a few weeks later, three weeks later, people have been handed huge. Bills. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? So we, yeah, you could do it. You could do a bunch of parody adverts where we're in you know, people are getting held up uh, on the way to Berlin and saying, no, you're not allowed to come in and do the yeah, same yeah. optimistic tone of voice. Yeah, yeah. it's but, funny you know, enough. That's it, isn't it? We're all, but, but we've all had enough of the, the political thing. So yeah. for you and me, let's go back to the start because we are both alumni of UCLan. We are, yeah. yeah. Which is How funny. The, 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 there's also like, I, I didn't know this at all, but obviously we have like people like Nick Park as well who went, yeah. to, went to there as well. Uh, and then I went randomly to a talk at, at RGA in Berlin. Yeah. And the guy, um, the guy was there, and he came from from the New York office, and he was like VP of brand, and I'd never heard of him before. And he was talking, and he uh, he showed a picture up on the board, and he was like, "Yeah, and this was my design school." I'm like, "That's you, Clan." And then I spoke to him afterwards, and his name's Mike Rigby, and yeah, he's also like an alumni of of. Uclan, uh, what else is that? There's there's also the guy from DDB, Nord, as well. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, he's he's also uh, an alumni, so yeah, crazy. Yeah, I, re- yeah. I reached out to, uh, you know, uh, I've been wrapped on the knuckles a couple of times for being too aggressive with, like, new business strategy, but, um, or, like, you know, just uh, reaching out to people uh, too often or something like that, but uh, I, I was reaching out to a couple of people who were at VCCP, and they came straight in from Uclan's creative advertising course. That's and- cool. And I was like, you know what? Like, when are we going to get the phone call to go back and do this masterclass for how to get into the creative <laughs> industry? You know? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know if I can help on that. I don't think there's any any crazy, like, e- easy way in these days. It's just, There's not. No. Tell, tell so. us about how you got in. Well, so, uh, I mean, going way back, I studied marketing for, for my degree. And to be honest, I wasn't really meant to go to, to, to university. I sort of, like, had my trajectory of finishing college and then just, I don't know, applying for the RAF or going somewhere like that because just didn't have any great 
great big plans or anything. And then my dad took me to, to Uclan, just have a look around. Um, and I, I don't know how it happened, but eventually I signed up on a media, English and marketing mixed course. Um, so I did that. Realized after year one that I hated English because um, they were talking about Russian, like, yeah, Russian, blah, blah, blah. And I thought... Oh. Well, like novels and stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's all like the literature side, side of things. And it just, that just wasn't for me, really. Um, but marketing, I loved because I thought this is like, you know, this is business, but this is like creative business. So I kind of yeah. like that. And uh, media as well, which I kind of continued, but then I eventually dumped that as well. And basically... After a false start um, in sort of like year, year two, I just focused on marketing as my final. Um, and I'm so glad I did because that, I think, gave me a really good basis for a lot of things, actually. Uh, a lot of strategy um, and, and that approach. Um, I never got onto the, the advertising side of things. And I wish I had, but marketing strategy is still pretty good. Uh, but I heard you know, from, from many people that the, the advertising course is... It's pretty good at, at you plan. So. Yeah, we uh, we just released, or I think we've released it now today, uh, a chat with the chief creative officer at Havas Links, Paul Kinsella. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a you planner as well. And I think he did the creative advertising thing. He was telling me about how he, he, he was very uh, guarded in saying I was at uni and I was working at the bar. And I never realized he probably meant source. And yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Ridiculous. Man, source, wow, that, that, that's going back. Yeah, yeah. Source survival. Exactly, exactly. Sticky floors. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I did, I did marketing with marketing strategies, like sort of like the main thing. Um, and then I went to work for a year, uh, just doing any old job. Um, I've actually got like, qual 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 uh, I've actually got qualifications in like, um, in energy efficiency. I don't know yeah. how it started as like a summer job and that progressed. So I did that for a year, but me and my partner at the time, thought, so, you know what, like, we kind of want to go somewhere, want to go and see the world, go and experience stuff. And Berlin was was the, num the number one because we were like, yeah, we were into making music, we are into dance music, we are all about like that sort of life. So we moved over with some savings in 2012, this is, uh, and we thought, you know, fuck it, we'll have 12, we'll have six months of just like, you know, living the life. Thinking that's, that, that's going to be it, six months. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then it got to like sort of month five and I thought, ah, shit, we need, I now need to start looking for a job and yeah. we're in Germany and Berlin. And I thought, well, at least now's a good time to like rely back on that sort of marketing degree a little bit. And uh, I got a three month internship at uh, Jamster. Um, do you remember the Crazy Frog? Oh God, yes. <laughs> oh God, yes. Yeah, so yeah. You there you go. Been, you must have been in like year 10 when that came out or something. Yeah, God, it was it, that. That was a very long time ago. At least, a, at least you know, two thousand and one or something. Ridiculous. I think it was. I think it was when I was in year seven, which was two thousand and four. Wow. Yeah. God. Yeah. So so long ago. Yeah. But they were still doing those, those ads. Those same ads. Uh, they were still running them, and they were still pretty pretty successful. But I was there for um, a couple of months. I think it was three months in total, or maybe less. And uh, and that actually, you know, like shitty sort of like products and stuff it's, you know it was a bit bit of a scam in a way but uh learned so much you know you you learn about uh buying ad space because we had yeah. to do all the all the ad space buying um we had to do concepts for like the production team to, to basically to to do um we had to think up of new products as well i mean products are very loose in this term yes, but yeah new products so actually it gave me a really good like basis of like what marketing is and also a bit of like the creative concept type of world as well. Um, but then I got poached by a WPP shop over here um, and I went to work as a social media manager for a year. Mm -hmm. And this is where it all goes a bit, bit weird. So I was a social media manager for a year um, and doing a lot of like sort of copy and uh, tracking of so social media campaigns. Um, but after sort of like a year of working for sunglasses and for mini, um, the creative director sort of like took me underneath her wing and said, you know, here's, here's some, some opportunities to work on some campaigns. Um, so, so is that, is that the first time you'd got to do creative work as opposed yeah, to strategy exactly. work? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I started to work as sort of like a, a writer. Um, but my, 
my creative director, Winnie Sang, um, she was really cool because she was also a bit like, you know, you don't just write. You can also look for mood boards. You, and then from the, I think it was one day, actually, there was a spare Wacom going. And she was just like, here you go, have a Wacom. And then suddenly, you know, it's like, right, so now I need to start, like, actually drawing stuff and comping things up and doing shit like that. Um, and she would help me, you know, which is good, um, and to improve and things like that. But up until then, you know, my sort of, like, my creative side of things wasn't Photoshop. It wasn't things like that. I dabbled in it when I was younger, but it wasn't, you know, how I was a creative. It's more, if anything, writing um, was yeah. my sort of background. I, get, I, I got that you were sort of about to kind of grasp at. It's like, if you had to give me a craft, you would go towards writer. But it yeah. sounds more like kind of overall concepting and, yeah. you know, yeah, thinking exactly. about stuff that way. Exactly. So, so and that, that's the... That's basically the, the main thing. It's just you know, it's, it is it is con- it is ideas yes. um, that are the most important thing in the world, really. For what we oh think. yeah, like uh, do, so. Do you do you have the same kind of, um, I suppose, jealousy that I have? You know, when you see people who are really well trained in the craft, particularly on visual things, and you know, designers who can just go, oh no, no, you just move that there and there, and then it's perfect. And how did you know that? I don't know how they do that. Uh, I am absolutely, yeah, well jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was actually speaking to, to one of our colleagues in London uh, last week and we're thinking about sort of like what we can, like themes that we can set for, you know, the, the agency or like for teams throughout the entire year. Yeah. Uh, and my sort of theme that I really want to focus on is like craft and, and detail and it's also one of the things that I'm just like, ah, oh, it's just, I'm just not good at it. Like, I'm big picture, great, yeah, but yeah. like, ah, oh, the details and getting really nitty gritty and pixel counting and, ah, oh, I do struggle a little bit. But, you know, um, that's why we have, you know, amazing designers, amazing yes. writers just to yes. help, um, help with that as well, so. And so there's so many there's so many things like I want to delve into and that are going to be interesting, but I want to stay on this craft versus ideas thing for a minute because I was talking about this with Jules Chalkley, the chief exec uh, creative at Ogilvy, and he said the same thing. He's like, you know, I, you, um, I am better with ideas than I am at craft. And I said, well, you can say that because you're the chief exec at Ogilvy, but, you know, I, I get all the time, I get like, you know, teenagers saying, oh, I have the best ideas in the world, but I just don't know how to get them out. And so I need someone to do that for me. So, you know, usually like young kids who want to be like rock stars. Yeah. And I say, well, no one's going to do it for you. Like how many how many technicians do you think are lining themselves up to turn you into a rock star? Yeah, exactly. They're going to keep those skills for themselves. Exactly. So, but you can learn craft and we'll go into this with some of the native instrument stuff later. But um, what do you, do you get a, um, what would you say, like a log jam? when you're trying to get your idea over to someone who does know the craft and it's and it, you have to be a master at articulating your idea i no i don't i don't think so i think because i've just done so many things yeah um whether it is like the art direction things whether it's um working on 3d stuff whether it's sort of like you know messing around in after effects whether it's you know even talking to composers and things like that like for me i don't i don't get too much of a log jam. Um, okay, good. Because, you know, I think, I think once you, you've done so many different things, like, it just informs you. Like, you might not be the best at doing it, but you kind of know how to guide somebody towards there. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't see too much of a problem. Well, that's really good. And But you said that you're trying to learn some of the craft now. Yeah. And, that, st- <laughs> and again, that's something that Jules said. He said, you can learn the craft. That's the good yeah. news. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it's all just patience and... Uh, just doing things like that, get, that, that's how you learn just do yeah. it um, and getting used to the frustration of when you've r- run through all the things you know how to do and you're still not getting what you want out of it and then you're like ah like now comes the pain I have to learn something new and feel stupid for a bit <laughs> yeah exactly exactly but, that, but that's like that's like the beauty of it because you learn something else and suddenly something that you've never even thought about before somewhere else becomes a lot easier um, so, you know, like, um, a good example is, you know, if you want to learn, want to learn to sort of like, um, draw eyes and things like that, you start doing big, bold shapes first that are so random. Yeah. And then suddenly you start getting like the muscle memory 
doing those like big shapes and suddenly that eye which was so difficult becomes a lot easier to sort of finesse yes. Yes. but it's, it's just the time and, <laughs> and it's also you know like the, when you have a great teacher it speeds up the process so much so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try and throw it up as an overlay here last year when we were in lockdown me and my two flatmates two guys I grew up with we were because uh, you know everyone had to be very creative in ways like how am I going to fill my weeks up and have a schedule so we were like Thursday night is like when we kind of teach each other a skill so Chris was teaching us how to code in Python I was teaching them how to use Ableton and uh, our mate Dixon uh was teaching us how to draw. And I believed forever, I cannot draw. That's it. Some people can, some people yeah. can't. And Dixon was like, no, no, okay, so draw me a head. And you go, what, just now? He's like, yeah, now. And you need to do it. And he goes, right, so everyone starts drawing a head with their wrists and you do circles with your arms like that. Yeah. And I just did it. I was like, oh my God, the, how did you know that? He's like, well, I've done it 15 years. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and exactly. that's it. It's like you say, you start out doing something and you think, well, I guess this is how it works. And you have to get, you have to get, well acquainted with that process of feeling like an idiot because you're doing it wrong because that's the only exactly. way you're going to get better. Exactly. And that's, and, that's, and that's the way it is. I mean, it's the same with music and yeah. you're learning an instrument. So, yeah. yeah. So let's get into that. You worked at Native Instruments. And yeah. what was your musical background? How did you get in there? Well, I've I played music since... I, well, I played instruments since I was young. I was actually thinking, I, I, I can't actually remember when I started to play like uh, play an instrument. It was definitely piano. Um, but I can't remember whether it was like five or six or seven, but it was yep. when I was very young. Um, and so I did that, you know, as a young student does. Um, and then I always remember being very nervous in like secondary school. I changed schools quite quite a bit when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And it was when I changed uh, sec secondary school in, yeah, it must have been... Um, this must have been 2001. I changed school and I had my headphones on in music. And I think we were all like meant to like play, I don't know, like a version of Bach or something like that, whatever it was that we have to learn in year seven. And I remember everyone else trying to play, play it like painfully. And then I just unplugged my headphones and there was a beat going. And then I just did a whole remix of this like yeah. Paco Bell's Canon or wherever it was. Yeah. I just thought, wow, well, okay, this is cool. The yes. teacher, like my teacher loved it. Um, and so I think he like took a shine into me and sort of like, um, yeah, just pushed me towards keep, keep making music. Um, and then I got into sort of like the realms of hanging out with music people who were all like into weird music. Yeah. There's like stoner guys and um, yeah, like sort of like metal guys, rock guys and, uh, and girls as well. Um, some jazz musicians and things like that. But to be fair, you know, you're saying there's girls as well. When we're at school, we don't know how to talk to girls. So we tend yeah. to, you know what I mean? We yeah, say yeah. Like that. Well, I think, I think not even that. Like, you know, when, when I eventually did my GCSEs in music, um, yeah. it was a class of, I think we were about seven or eight people yeah. in the class. And there was like two girls. So yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's how it is. And, you know, we were, we were a pretty big year. We were at least, a, I don't know, 150, 200 people in my year. Yeah. Um, so to go from that many people down to, a, you know, seven, eight people, whatever. And then two of those are girls. Just, I mean, yeah. That's yes. The, that, that's how crazy it was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I did, I did that. I studied music, um, went and did music tech at college, um, which was okay. And that's, when, and that's when I sort of like gave up and thought, like, no more education, go to, I don't know, the RAF or just go and get another job somewhere else. Um, it's interesting that your first thought was like, well, not your first thought maybe, but the RAF, you know what I mean? So you could have been uh, Captain Cook. And yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, why didn't you just chase that for his, for his own sake? Yeah, well, my dad went to, my dad went to, to, to the Navy in the 70s um, and he was in like brass bands and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah. So oh, were you considering doing one of those where, where you do music in the military and they kind of pay your way or? I wasn't even thinking, mate, to be honest. Ah, okay, <laughs> it was yeah. just one of those, just like, I mean, you grew up in those type, like... Were well, you about 16 I, at this point, 16, 17? I was 17 uh, or 18, yeah. And then, you know, the financial crash happened. Mm. And, that, and that, that's when I thought, sod this, I'll just go and get a job anywhere. Yeah. Um, because there was there was no, nothing up north, really, to be honest. Yeah, for, for hard times. I mean, I was quite well protected from that. I was in year 10 in the financial crash. Shut so. up. Yeah, Shut sorry. Up. <laughs> but, yeah it's exactly. like um, people that age during covid if you're like 13 you know you've missed a fair bit of school but you're yeah. not in gcse you're not in primary school so you've got your development done and you yeah. haven't got a job so if you're 13 at the moment you've just got time off school 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> ah, it's just it's bizarre. It's weird. weird. But anyway, so yeah. uh, so that's like my music background, and then obviously I moved to Berlin because I wanted to make tech techno and. Uh, did that release quite a bit of music when I was here in sort of my, my first few years before okay. you know the advertising job yeah. uh, takes over a little bit um, and then you know I was going through different agencies we spoke before about the one at WPP mm-hmm. and I did a year here at Sports and Entertainment uh, yeah. in Berlin um, that was really cool then I went to another agency that was a boutique agency for ASICS and ASICS Tiger um, and we did some stuff for Diageo um, which was really fun, really small, like, band of rebels. It was, like, yeah, pretty interesting. And then, sort of, like, I was able to, well, the job came up, basically, to be a marketing manager at Native Instruments. And I yes. thought, you know, I've used, I've used Native Instruments since I was literally 13. Yeah. Um, so why not go, go for it? And I went to the interview, and, you know, I think it was, like, a pretty wild interview process. I think, in total, it was, I don't know, five, six hours between... Yeah. Three, three different meetings of people. So it's a long process, but, you know, the first sort of meeting that I had, uh, we had to present, like, you know, a marketing strategy type thing. And I'd done this presentation from, like, Adlan style. So it was like, you know, he, here's the mock-ups, here's the copy. Oh, okay, so that kind of helped you get over the line a bit because you were exactly. trained in presenting to clients. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. And also, you know, the presentation that, that, that you were sort of, like, asked to create, um, for me, it's, I mean, it was a concept, it's like, by that point, I'd done a million of them, to yeah. a million different brands or whatever, so it was fine. And we were um, maybe competing against other candidates who weren't going to have like a full pitch deck. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly, for sure, for sure. And then, um, and then after I presented, we had about an hour and a half uh, just talking about Native Instruments, and they were asking me, so what was my history with them? And I was like, yeah, you were the first software that, like, no, you were actually the second piece of software I learned to crack. When I was 13, you know, the first piece was Cubase. Wow. Um, so you went in saying, I nicked your stuff. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, and somehow they, they you know, they, they hired me. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I was working there for, for, for a year. Uh, and that was pretty, pretty cool as well. But I'm guessing with organizations like that, like Native and, you know, Waves and all the big, big, big audio brands, they're not stupid. They must know it's so easy to crack their software. So yeah. what's their, how do they get around that? What's their business plan for saying it's so easy to get it for free? You know, uh, how do they justify? Uh, or what's the right question? You know what I mean? How are they okay with it? Yeah. I, I, it's, it's difficult though, because, you know, like, whilst, it, whilst there is piracy, and obviously piracy does happen, you know, they're, they're still selling enough, um, enough products at the end of the day. You know what yes. I mean? So it's not So we've got cheap. big enough profit margins that the 10,000 teenagers cracking it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And also like, I, I mean, this isn't, this isn't their strategy at all. Um, but I also think that like, you know, as soon as you make something accessible for people, even if you don't get their, their email address or telephone number or contact or whatever, they're in your funnel if yes. you know what I mean, they're, yes. they're in your world. So if something else pops up, yeah. it becomes a bit more like, okay, blah, blah, blah. And then you start building that way. The thing is, I guess, I guess they kind of saw this as like, you know, people are still sort of like pirating software in 20, uh, 2018, I think it was. And so that's when they, they created Complete Start, which was like their, their free, free uh, Complete Bundle. Amazing. And then that that's, I mean, it's a fucking amazing bundle. Like, if so I'd have got like, that when I was like yeah. 13, just, I mean, it's amazing. What's, so. what, what's in it for the benefit of the take? What's in it? Uh, I think Monarch is in it. I think yep. there's some Machina drums, yep. I think. Um, and just, yeah, a few other. Few other so it's enough things. of a hamper that you get, you kind of what you need to get started. And then the, the so the, this, the, it sounds like you were saying the strategy is regarding how easy it is to crack software. Uh, eventually, ten some percentage of the people cracking the software become customers because they yeah. love our product, which yeah. we do. You know, I will say I was cracking Waves uh, plugins. That's how I learned to mix using Waves yeah, when I was exactly. a student because someone exactly. went, oh, here's a USB with all the stuff. And that, then for that reason, you know, I came into gas and I was like, we have to get the Waves Diamond bundle. And so now it's on our, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's not what you're going to pay for. That's it. Exactly. I mean, I think, I think um, of, of all the companies who did it, like, exceptionally i think adobe 
did it amazing. And yes, I have a lot of admiration for them because we just uh, updated all our uh, editing software to be all Adobe. And I'm like, it's just, I, it's, it's easier than piracy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, I mean, it's an ecosystem. You can pay, you know, shit tons for the, for the full suite. You can also just get the bits and pieces that you need. Yeah. Um, it all works together, like, seamlessly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they, they, they smashed it, really. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think with Native, like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really interesting business because, you know, like, I don't know, when, when you think of, of, when you think of them in terms of, of a, like, another brand, um, they are literally almost like the Adidas, you know what I mean? Like everyone, if you, were, if you were to compare them it. to another sector, yeah. yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. So it's like everyone's got some Adidas trainers at some point in their life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you know, they 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 do take you from sort of like bedroom amateur first, yes. like musician to you know, like to the top of the top. And yeah. everybody uses that their, their products. So uh, so that's really cool. And then you know you, you you have a lot of these like these these sort of newer com competitors now. Um, I, well, they're not really competitors, but you know when, when when you think of like Spitfire, I think they actually describe themselves as like you know being a bit more like Burberry or Barber, you know, like very British and yeah. sort of like that's yeah. their their sort of like their, their DNA really. So, but the thing with Spitfire is you still have to plug it into the contact. Uh, more or less. Yeah, so it's yeah like more or less. They've done that empire building thing at Native where you're like, cool, you can compete with us as long as you're in our shop window. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think there's a few few new newcomers. Is it Gorilla? Is I'm not sure one? about Gorilla. You'll have to tip me off about that. I, I, I have no idea. I think it's called Gorilla. I might be completely and utterly wrong. Um, but that's I think that's like a new contact style yes. Yes. Um, thing. Never used it though. Um, well, the yeah. thing, the thing I get when you look at stuff like you know, because we use we we have the complete uh, package here. That's that's kind of what we got started on as composition tools, and, and obviously we've got Spitfire now and and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Omnisphere, one of my favorite synths yeah. in the world. The problem is with less so with Omnisphere, but generally with all audio audio software anyway. I always look at it and I'm like. I am only using like 5% of what this can do. There yeah, is yeah. so much. And I, I feel like I can't tell if I've got the right approach because I'm sure it's something like if you get the right sound out of it, you're using it right for you. It's yeah. not meant to be that everyone uses all of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Are you, are you using a complete control? We have, yes, they've got a complete control uh, here just off camera, 88 keys. Uh, I, don't yeah. use, I don't use the software plugin that you're referring ah, okay. to that much. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's good for browsing, but... I still think no one has quite cracked that problem of how to browse for the perfect instrument because yeah, yeah, yeah. do you use, use battery, the drum drum library? I do, yeah, yeah. But I but I use it in complete control software, you see. Right. Tell and me that, how to do that. Well, no, no, you can just like you, you can actually just load it up. Yes. Um, just like So you so, so if I was I've got so I've got a Cubase session here. Yeah. I open uh I open complete control. That's where you'd start. You'd be looking yeah. using that thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So it just it becomes your wrapper. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, that was one of my, my products that I had to sort of lead on. And for, for ages, I was just thinking like, what, like what's the benefit of this? Like, who's going to actually utilize this? Like, what, what, what's the reason? Why was that and a challenge? Was it because everyone already knew what they would go to? Yeah, like everyone has their own work workflows. And yes. I was the marketing manager for it. And even I had my own workflow that didn't involve complete yeah. control <laughs> at all. And then, you know, like, I think I, think I gave it a, a couple of weeks. And, and after a couple of weeks, I thought, fuck me, this is so easy. Now, Why have I like, not been using this? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because you literally have all the presets you could possibly want, all the sort of plugins you need. You and can, you can bash all the plugins into the interface without clogging up your DAW. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I use Ableton um, and I'm sort of like a, a stock stock sort of yeah. EST person. Um, I think you can do like tons of stuff with that. When you say stock VST, do you mean the <laughs> instruments that come built into Ableton? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. So like there, there are reverbs and things. I, I have a few Max for Life um, yes. convolution stuff. But, yeah, the convolution um, reverbs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that is one thing I will say about Ableton. I really hope this isn't getting too geeky for anyone listening, but the Ableton <laughs> reverbs the, the native reverbs are, are very good. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. The native ones, especially yeah. the the tight ones. You know, the, this this there's a new one coming right uh, in Ableton 11. Right. So I think I think that's that's meant to be like some crazy cool 
reverb shit. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we'll see to what get, that comes to, out to like. Get, <laughs> to get back onto complete control, we should yeah. say for the benefit of the tape, because uh, some people listen to this podcast while they're working from home um, and will not know what we're on about. And some people will be, you know, uh, music techie. Uh, nerds who know exactly what we're on about. Complete control. Effectively, well, you're the marketing manager, so you can describe it, but it's a way of not only browsing for, but also playing instruments in the same window, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's basically it. You just summed it up. <laughs> but, but crucially, you don't, it's not, you don't just look, scroll and look around for them. You can actually type or like select, you know, what kind of sound are you looking for? Airy or, you know, yeah, exactly. deep so it's, or, yeah. Exactly. So it's, so it's all tag based. Um, yeah. So that makes it super easy to, to look for things that, that you want. Um, you can obviously search for stuff. They, they really try to do stuff with uh, samples as well. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know about, about the sample player. I've never really uh, got, got into that. I always just use either Sampler or Simpler uh, in Ableton um, or EXS in Logic. But yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, even there with, this, with, with Ableton's um, Sampler, I'm like, yeah. I'm only going to use the simpler because that sampler looks complicated. It's, it's pretty intense, you know, and then, yeah. and then you can put things like all like your AM and FM synthesis and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But um, so, you, so you were marketing manager at uh, Native Instruments and you were trying to crack the problem of who needs complete control and why do they need it? And you started yeah. using it. How did you take what you'd learn and try and get it out there for people? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we tried. Uh, but by this point, I'd left, but I'd already had the habit of, of using complete control. Um, so the sort of habit of using complete control came, like, you know, basically as I was leaving. Um, mm. So I didn't work on that, on that project anymore. Um, but we were always trying to sort of, like, show, like, look, this, is, this makes your life easier. Like, the browsing makes it easier. Um, the fact that you know you don't need to look through your sort of VST folder and remember what particular piano that you want is like here's a nice uh, GUI you know and it's noir that you want to play with or whatever like you know like so so things like that just to just to make people realize that you know this wrapper basically which is what it is it's just a wrapper for your yes. your, for your VST um, is actually quite quite useful when you're a composer when you're beat making you just really want to find stuff really fast yes um so and that and that was the main thing and especially for people who have or who had a com complete start trying to make this sort of a workflow um you know like your your, your basic essential workflow tool um i think was quite important the fact that you know you load in your your sound or whatever and all the knobs are, are already mapped out yes here, or like the key ones i mean like that's that's just flipping amazing. The thing so is, again, you know? for, the, for the benefit of any layman listening, what that what that means, in my understanding, is that if you bring up a Massive X synthesizer, my favorite synth is Massive X. If you bring up one of those, and you want to play with the sounds a bit, there's a, like a bunch of arbitrary knobs on most keyboards that yeah. you know you can just turn, but they won't do anything unless you spend hours assigning variables to them, like yeah. dynamics and exactly. pitch and all this stuff. Exactly. When you get your instrument on complete control, it's already all done, so you've effectively got, effectively got this off-the-shelf synthesizer the, uh, or instrument every time coming into the same keyboard and, yeah. you know, really, really uh, manipulable. Yeah. And so when I'm talking to producers at the moment, a lot of the, the question I get is, you know, when I'm trying to uh, pitch and, and win business, they say, you yeah, know, I'm getting a bit tired of the MIDI sound though. Can you do anything? What's, can you, if you, if you, if you do anything live? And I think what most people outside the industry don't know at the moment is that almost everything is a sample. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. I mean, we have computers now which are, like so, like the, the processing capabilities are massive. Yes, most people have at least sixteen gigabytes of RAM. Um, obviously, yeah, you can do lots of things with like you know with with synths and do all like the, the sort of like the analog modeling and blah blah blah. But I mean, you can also just sample a Moog or whatever, and yeah. you know it sounds the exact same. And you know, you use that, it, it gets assigned to your RAM. Um, but obviously, we all got a huge RAM. Now, anyway, so yeah. why, why not use samples, you know? And then you can just sample more and more and more and more yeah. obscure things as well. And so know? I suppose what it means is like every string 
you know, bow, every string yeah. note you hear coming out of one of our compositions, it was once a, that is the recording of someone playing that note. Exactly. And just some people who are absolute wizard with technology and software have made it so that you can play it with a keyboard. Exactly. Uh, did you ever get much interaction with the actual development people at Native Instruments? No, like not not too much. Um, that was basically a, another team. We yeah. dealt mainly with like individual products, and I dealt with complete um, complete suite basically. Yeah. Um, complete suite is like it makes up a huge chunk of the business, and it's quite sort of like very important, um, or at least it did. Um, I think it does, uh, hmm. and uh, you know, like that made made up a big chunk chunk of the business. So it needed yeah. like looking after uh, the individual products. Um, they were important, but you know, it's it's yeah, it was another team basically. Well, that's um, the thing. I, I know, I know, I know that my friend went to to Cremona though. He 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 went to, to Italy um, to Cremona where they have these amazing Stradivarius violins going mm. back four or five hundred years. And and they, they got were sampled. sampled. Them. Yeah, yeah, and they were sampling them for uh, for the what's it called? Something quartet, Cremona quartet. I think yeah, it is. Um, and that sounds amazing. Like, wow, that sounds amazing. It's a little bit bright, but for like a Stratovarius that's like four, five, five hundred years old, worth you know, well over a million. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, so, for a violin. That- Another thing for the benefit of the layman, uh, yeah, the Stradivarius violins, uh, I think you'd agree with this, wouldn't you, Tim? They're, they're considered the best violins in yeah. the world ever made. Yeah. And yeah. was Stradivarius the engineer who made them? Uh, I th- I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. I, I, I'm not entirely sure the whole entire pro- uh, project. I know that they just that some of them go back literally to like the 15 or 1600s. Yeah, they're like the Rolls Royce. There's, yeah, only, there's a yeah. select number of them and they sound amazing. Yeah, they, they, they had to... I mean, the story of that is absolutely incredible. There, there was a security guard there with, like, mm. I think, I think he had a gun or something, and like An armed guard for the violin. Yeah, basically, yeah, nobody can go near it. Um, <laughs> for, for for the entire month, I think they were they, they were recording. Um, the mayor told everybody to be quiet <gasps> because they were recording, and you know they could hear like even footsteps and stuff out, outside this this auditorium or whatever it is. Oh yeah, because you, when you record something like that, you want to record it in a concert hall, not in a dead studio. It, well, I think, yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure exactly what, what the what the room was. I think it was actually a, a special quartet room as well, because yeah. it's a quartet um, they were recording. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it sounds amazing. They, they have this like really weird contact, because contact's a BST. Um, mm-hmm. And they had this uh, this thing with um, all the scripting, all the crazy back end scripting, where the vibrato, mm-hmm. like, I th- I think it moves between different samples. So the vibrato actually almost sounds like sounds really close to actual vibrato, which wow. is really difficult um, and very very nerdy. So yeah, well, it's the yeah. it's the same thing as ever, isn't it? The hardest thing at the moment. This is going to change in our lifetime, but at the moment, the hardest thing. Uh, for us with computers is to make them act and think like people. You have to be... like That's what code's all about, right? Uh, the coding is trying to talk to a computer in language that it understands because it's so... You need to be so specific and prescriptive and, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's just a specific gripe I have with some bits of software that they don't... They still lack human intelligence. So yeah. uh, do you have any voice assistants like Alexa or anything like that? No, no, I, no, no. No, it's just yeah. not for me. I don't know, like... Also, in uh, especially, I think, in Germany, um, I mean, I've lived here for almost 10 years now. And in that time, you, you pick up a lot from, from the culture and the vibe. And I don't know, I think things like, things like Alexa and Google Home, they are picking up a little bit now, but it's still, you know, why would I want to have a voice assistant in my home that's always listening, that's yeah. like, here? yeah. However, you know, I go back home at Christmas and... My dad's got one uh, right next to his bed because that's yeah. what he uses for his alarm. My sister's got one in her in her um, kitchen. Yeah. My niece and nephew both have what's so, all. I mean, you know, so that's really got weird. So back they've back. they've taken on more here in a way that they haven't in Germany. Yeah. yeah Do you yeah. think for some reason in Germany, maybe in parts of Germany, they're a little bit wary of bugging their own house? It brings back <laughs> memories, you know. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think so. But I think I think they're also conscious of that as well. Like they're not they're not. Um, you know that they've lived through that, and they've yeah, they've had actual, really crazy yeah. experiences. Um, yeah. So of course, uh, you know they are a bit more warier. 
Um, That's wary. mad. I never thought of that, that, you know, us in America are uh, so much more willing to, to have voice assistance because we haven't lived under an authoritarian regime. I mean, the, the, the differences are quite stark now that, I, that, that I've been here for so long and then I go back, especially for a month, yeah. and you, you see how things are, are different. Um, you know, even like the topic of sort of like mental health in, in yes. the UK... It's it's huge. What's the and difference between there and here? I don't. I really don't. Don't see the the topic being talked about in the same way over here. You know, like literally back in the UK, you can be watching, uh, you know, GNTV or whatever it is now. Uh, yes. And you know, like maybe they have someone just talking about whatever book they're doing or whatever, or, you know, their chef or whatever, and then they can literally be in the next sentence talking about their, their mental health and how they've they've ov- overcome that. It's much more part of the dialogue now of, of entertainment of, mm. you know, and, that, and that type of thing. And then you see the adverts and things that are coming out. Yes. Um, and so it's, a, it's that, that's a massive difference that I see already. Um, and then there's, yeah, there's just loads, loads of bits and pieces which are different. Even, even, even up until, probably up until about two, two or three years ago, um, sort of like all, automatic cash machines or like automatic um, shop Oh, is uh, that what they call them in America? Automatic teller machines. I, I have no idea because I've actually com- com- completely forgot the, the 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 word from that. But do you know when you're in a shop and you go to shelf uh, self self uh, self checkout? Yeah, they're called, called Casa here. But uh, even up until about three years ago, you wouldn't really have uh, like a, a self service yeah. at all. And people, when they do use them, like. They're very wary. They don't understand the UX of it. They don't understand like how it all kind of works. So that's quite sort of strange. That's fascinating. Um, it really is. And uh, I mean, COVID was quite interesting because COVID um, sort of like made a lot of lo- local businesses um, actually get for the first time like you know pay by card, like yeah. card card machines. Yeah. So now you know you have local shops that you can actually pay for with card because literally up until then you'd have to go like and <laughs> get cash. And yes. only paying cash, um, and where I live, you know, that's still a thing that lots of co- lots of like small businesses still all only want to be paid in cash. Yeah, um, it's, so it's, it's it's interesting because I don't know much about Germany at all, and so I'm probably flying way. Uh, someone's going to correct me and you know slap me for this, saying that it has anything to do with you know the East Germany West Germany divide. From that perspective, because obviously you're in Berlin, but you're talking yeah. about the German culture itself, not just Berlin. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, there's definitely a Berlin-centric nature to it. Having been to like Frankfurt and to other yeah. places, they, they are a bit more different because they have, you know, well, I mean, Frank, Frankfurt is more like the financial yes. uh, area. Munich is very sort of like international and has been for Is Munich years. kind of hipstery and, you know, kind of cool? <sighs> Munich gets a bad press in Berlin, right. but because uh, it's Bavaria, so like it's okay. like the north-south divide type thing. Okay, yeah. uh, it still exists even in Germany. But um, yeah. I, I actually don't mind uh, Munich. It's, it, it's 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 a really be- beautiful city. It's quite sort of like uh, old. Yeah. Um, but it is nice. Um, everyone's just different. Like Berlin yeah. is very more like creative and like bohemian and like you know musicians and artists. And yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, whereas Munich's not quite that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really nice and, you know, half an hour away, you're in like Alps and things like that. So, so I guess I guess the question is, and this is, this is, I know what you mean. This is where I am an idiot. Um, is Berlin uh, in what was formerly West Germany? Uh, 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 blah, 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 blah. Former East, order. Right. Former East. Are you doing a quick Google? Yeah. That was, that was what was informing my question, really, because I was going to say, um, we're talking about the voice assistants. And yeah. obviously, you know, East Germany existed until, what was it, 1990? So yeah. from a psychological perspective, the Second World War only ended like 30 years ago. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, basically for them. And, uh, you know, they had this, well, it wasn't the Second World War, but, you know, they had this sort of like, um, that's socialism um, yes. from, from Russia. Um, and you know, a, a, a large, a, a high proportion of people were government informants. So, yeah, it's hard to ship a product in that kind of environment where it listens to you all the time. 
But um, and I, I got that idea, by the way, from Pod Save America, which was a podcast by President Obama's speechwriters. And they were laughing about it in 2016. They said Jeff Bezos couldn't understand why people didn't want to bug their own living room. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't shifting as well. But the, I guess back to the original point was, it's about human intelligence. You have to ask a very specific question to vo- still to voice assistants. They won't generalize from what you're trying to say and understand what, you know, get the gist of it. Yeah. So, you know, I do wonder when that's going to change. But obviously with the, you know, that's what we were talking about, the whole coding thing and uh, the interaction with the dev team at Native Instruments. And I suppose one of the things that reveals, one of the things my question reveals is I've never worked in a business that is that big where effectively there are whole teams that feel like they may as well be in different companies or even different countries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the stuff that they were talking about was was wild and crazy. Um, and, you know, you don't really... Talk, talk to them um, very often. Um, and yeah, they would, I mean, it, it, it was quite big, you know. There, there was 400 in Berlin and then I think 200 around the rest of the world. You know, they got an LA office. Um, they had one in China, London office as well. Um, Paris, they, they'd had, I think they were opening up a Canadian office as well. So... You know, they, they were growing and, and they're huge around, around the world. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things as well where you, you never realize, you know, for what we do in music tech, in music production, you don't realize that like, companies like that do exist. They are big. Um, because, I don't know, for me anyway, it just felt like, it always felt a bit like personal and intimate. Mm-hmm. But maybe that's just because I used them since I was 13 or whatever. I don't know. No, I do know what you mean. Uh... There's something very seductive about their product. And, you know, a bit of background for me, when I I came into this business when it was about a year and a half old, uh, maybe two years, and I was just, I I had learned a bit on Logic and wasn't really a producer and a bit on Ableton. And unless you're very, very good and you said you work with the, what's a better, I want to say native, but native is confusing in this context. You know, the the inbuilt VSTs in yeah. Ableton. Yeah. I think, I think personally, unless you're very good, they're actually quite difficult to make them sound good if you're a beginner. Yeah. Uh, they can sound quite flat and flabby. And yeah. so I would come in here and Steve, uh, who was the, the sort of senior engineer at the time, a senior composer, would be, you know, uh, just calling up instruments and playing them and they sounded amazing out of the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they sound that good that you can, for a demo, you can get away with just playing everything in and not even doing a mix because, yeah. you know, somehow they're all designed to sit together. So yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, they are great. And it's, that's, you know, it's been interesting talking to you about what your experience was like there being in the, uh, forgive me, being in the mothership. But we've not talked about uh, MNC Saatchi, which is where no, you are haven't. now. Yeah, and you know it's very rare <laughs> yeah. that you have a conversation in advertising with an advertiser from a Saatchi business, and you don't talk about Saatchi. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Ted, talk to me about how you got. I know I get the impression you kind of went in and out and then back in again. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk, I mean, I, yeah. I was working for WPP, um, which was cool, and working on Pan- Panasonic and Mini, uh, which are yeah. good clients. Um, but then after sort of like doing you know the millionth Panasonic fridge. Yeah, I thought, you know what, there's got to be more to this. And, uh, and I was, I sent, I sent up my my portfolio to the guys here in um, in Saatchi in sports and entertainment. I got invited in, uh, managed to wing it. I, I don't know what the hell I talked about for an hour, but we talked about something. Um, and yeah, they hired me as their sort of like in sports and entertainment here as their first creative um, that they'd ever had that was in house. So that was like cool. Um, and then I was here for a year. We did some pretty cool stuff for Volkswagen, um, a lot for Volkswagen, actually. Um, we did some stuff for Heineken and bits and pieces like that. Um, but then I got poached to go to uh, a boutique agency, which was The Adventures Of, um, where we did stuff for ASICS and ASICS Tiger. Yeah. And that was like really cool, um, very sort of like rebellious in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I, then I went to Native. And then I came back uh, because I just, for, for me, Native was really cool and it is a really good aid, like a good company to work for. Um, but I just missed the pace of life of agency world. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it is faster. It's more demanding. Um, you know, but I, I kind of thrive on that because I, I thrive on like that bit of pressure just that, you know, 
create diamonds basically. Yes. Um, and that's what I was kind of, kind of missing. So eventually, you know, I got an offer to come back here as CD, um, to lead the, lead the department here. Um, and that was like, you know, crazy because I'd gone from sort of like kind of mid uh, creative and then I went to sort of like marketing manager, which is a whole new like world of project managing and yes. blah, 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 blah. And then to come back in as creative director um, was like pretty cool. Um, so what are the big differences between, you know, often people get promoted internally, they go creative to creative director. And I imagine there's a bit of a transition period where your former colleagues now see you as, I thought you were still one of us, but now you're the manager. Uh, was yeah. there, did you manage to avoid that because you went out and back in? No, I think, I think when I first started, there was a brief period where it felt a bit like that, mm -hmm. but that changed pretty quickly. Um, they, they were they're really accepting here at, at Saatchi. Like we are a big family, to be honest, um, mm -hmm. and we look after each other. And so it all just felt very natural. It was really good to be back, to see some, like, fr some friendly faces, yeah. see some new faces. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just like, I've stayed here at, at Sports Events for the last, what, two, three years now. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, been good. it's been good. So what kind of projects do you get to work on if you're in sports and entertainment? Well, a lot of stuff that we... So it's, it's, it's crazy because, you know, we have like... So in Berlin office, um, just to give a bit of context to everybody, uh, we've been around since, God knows, since, since 2006 as M&C Saatchi. Yeah. Uh, in 2012, we started the sports and entertainment business here. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a digital side as well. So in total, we're about 60 people. In sports and entertainment, we're about, I don't know, maybe 11, 12-ish people. Oh, so it's um, not even that big? No, it's not. It's not, it's not massive. Um, but for what we do, like we have a pretty good team set up. Yep. Um, we're also still nimble enough to, you know, we can have, we can work with the other teams as well, um, wherever we need to, mm -hmm. um, on joint projects, which is cool. Um, and so, yeah, um, we're, we're a small team, very nimble. I completely forgot the question. Uh, it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's what we all do when we start selling, isn't it? Uh, wait, I started talking about us again. Well, really <laughs> it was uh, about managing the transition from being one of the you know team to leading the team and the friction that that might, that might uh, cause. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, there wasn't any, any crazy friction. Like the type of work that we do, Yep. That was it. That was the question. Uh, like, I, I'm gonna, we're going to make sure our editor animates a light bulb going on. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely do. I mean, it's Friday. Come on. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the type of work that we do. So um, we do. We we were primarily known for like a lot of, of activation stuff, mm -hmm. um, especially around brand experience. And those are big marketing words, but we did basically lots of uh, booths, stands, things like that. Uh, we We've done lots of sponsorship, uh, like strategy and guidance, yeah. stuff that you don't necessarily see as a consumer, um, but all, but, you know, which are big topics uh, mm -hmm. that, that we dealt with. Um, we have done uh, branded content, which was a big thing. Um, and it's something that, you know, we still push uh, throughout here. And we've now done our first sort of like made for TV ad um, last year, at the end of last year. Okay. Um, so that's kind of cool but basically we do a bunch of different disciplines from PR to branded content to activations to strategy yeah. to God knows what else uh, it's the full range um, but mainly within the pro properties of sports entertainment um, people sort, sort of passions really um, yeah that's, that's the type of stuff that we're into and last year we launched um, Fabric, which is our sort of like lifestyle um, sub brand. Yeah, and that's all to do with like um, like people's hyper passions, whether it's that's like food or cooking or um, yoga or things like that. Yeah. Like really going even deeper now on you know it's not just like sports and lifestyle. It's like yoga or like uh, strongman or powerlifting or whatever you know yeah. those types of things. So yeah, that's mainly what what we do. Um, we're pretty lucky that we get to do some pretty enviable work. We, mm -hmm. you know, like last year we did stuff with Roger Federer, uh, which is really cool. And we worked with uh, Fabio Vibner, who's a really like amazing Red Bull athlete. Um, and we did some, yeah, loads of bits and pieces. We've um, done the UEFA 20, 
2015, because I'm not a football fan, but we did the UEFA uh, 2015 sort of like final um, sort of like, yeah, trophy um, tour, which was like amazing. Um, so yeah. It surprised me that you're not a football stuff. person because I don't know, for some reason, I think it must just be the accent I assumed you would be. But, um... <laughs> if everyone asks me, because, you know, like whenever you live abroad, also, also where you're from, I mean, you always have to say, well, I'm from near Manchester or Manchester. Yeah, I always like, feel bad for you guys. Yeah, who are like, who are like orbiting Manchester. So, you know, Blackpool yeah. and uh, Lancashire types. You always have to say, yeah, I'm from near Manchester. You have to, you know, yeah. Pretty much, pretty much. But so, so are you, are you, are you from, from Manchester proper or? Yeah, well, you know, people from Manchester proper tell me I'm not, and I don't sound like it, I grant you. But um, yeah, I'm from Stockport, which is, okay, yeah, 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 you know yeah. what that is, a little, little do, town just yeah. south of the Manc. But no, yeah. I'm not from like Levenshume or Moss Side or anything, you know, like people, yeah, yeah. people from those kind of areas say, yes, we are from Manchester and that's where the, the uh, perimeter yeah, yeah. cuts off. But um, yeah, one thing I was going to ask, I, I, was, I really wanted to, to know, and we, we're sort of running short on time, might overrun by a little bit, is working in a uh working in germany let's say and you know you're like me a northerner from the north of england how do you manage do you have to work in german i presume you speak german by now uh i, I speak badly um <laughs> and i understand more than i let on uh, and that's a good tip for anybody um, yeah. but uh yeah i think we have a healthy balance um and it comes down to to trust as well um, we've got a he- healthy balance of good creatives. Um, not all of our work is German cent- centric, so a lot of the stuff that we do is like with global brands. So whether that's Mercedes, um, um, yeah, especially with with Mercedes, it's global work that we deal with. So um, we don't really tend to go um, or tend to need to sort of deliver presentations and things in German. It's ma- mainly in in English. Well, how do you manage then living there for 10 years and not being super fluent? I mean, you, you strike me as well adjusted and you don't seem like, you know, I, I, my assumption would be that you'd feel somewhat isolated not speaking the language. But I guess everyone speaks English there, don't they? Pretty much, yeah. And like, as I said, I, I do, I can speak enough to, to, to get, get by. by and to speak to people if I want to and when yeah. I want to. So that's not really a, too, too much of an issue. I would say that, you know, like it is always worth you know, learning language. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely terrible at doing it. Um, but again, it's one of those things that I need to I need to improve on. My girlfriend's Italian as well. And I'm trying uh, to learn Italian. And that's also, you know, I've been with her for, for a few years now. And even that, it's just like, well, I, I take it. Um, not enough. <laughs> so, so is she fully like trilingual and speaking everything? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she, I mean, she can speak English, English, German, uh, Spanish, I think some French. Yeah. And now she can, Northern as well, so she's she's fluent. She's got the accent. Yeah, she's fluent on Lancastrian. Amazing. <laughs> like so, I, I used to work with a girl called Alexia Lamaru. I think she was called, and uh, she was from Germany and uh, spoke English better than I did. And then we had some. It was when I was in hospitality. Uh, we had some French customers come in, and I was like, "God, guys, what are we going to do?" And Alexia just starts speaking full French and sits them down. I was like, yeah. "How are you all doing this? Why are we? Why are we so bad at this in England?" Yeah, but it is. But it is like the the system of how we're brought up. I mean, you get taught, mm. I mean, it's crazy now that you think about it, that, that you know, we, we, we get to learn French and if you got up French, you can then learn German. Yeah. But then we also, you know, we completely omit learning Scots Gaelic or Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> two of the like, two, two of the languages that you're, you can literally be at within a few hours, you yeah. know, that are on your doorstep and you just don't learn them either. You're just like, this makes no sense. Well, that's when you um, learn the, uh, the 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 dark industrial motivations behind why you were educated. It's like, are you more or less likely to be economically useful speaking Irish Gaelic or Scottish yeah. Gaelic or Welsh? Yeah, yeah. And then you know, as you, you you even indicated there, it's uh, regrettably no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's that's the main thing, isn't it? Really, but yeah. maybe now it might change. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> hey, yeah, now we're all uh, now we're all Brexited up. It's going to be yeah, good. Exactly, so. Uh, exactly. Let's uh, let's do let's do the final chapter because you're very obviously interested in music and very passionate about it, and so I need to know what you're listening to. I'm going to need you to send a Spotify playlist over to us because we I do all be. for all the episodes now. But yeah. well, yeah, what's uh, what's on your record collection right now? Uh, right now is a lot of Colin Stetson, um, lots of crazy sort of weird uh, post post metal. Mm-hmm. So my sort of like background was you know 
especially when I was a teenager, it was like grindcore and stoner music and death metal and things like that. Yeah. So that that's with me. Um, so yeah, the new the new Cult of Luna will be there, and I've listened to them since yeah since about two thousand and two. Yeah, one of my favorites. There'll probably be some Oasis on there because you know that's just who I am as well. Unavoidable, isn't it? Yeah, I love Oasis. And no other than I listen to Oasis, like so. Is there a bigger cliche? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. A Londoner like, singing Wonderwall. <laughs> exactly, and and I'm sure there'll be some 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 techno on there. Um, who knows what? Um, but yeah, there'll definitely be some some techno. Yeah. always on the playlist as well. Yeah, I had you know um, I had a moment where. I was started discovering what what well, I don't know what they call it. I think they call it electronic listening music. You know where it's not dance music, yeah. but it is by a great producer like Bonobo yeah. or Fortet or John Hopkins stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, But you know you might feel a bit it'd be weird dancing to John Hopkins. Well, maybe it would. It's very intense. But um, but yeah, I, I am happy about that aspect of my personality. I inherited it from my father. Where you know for many people, and I don't think you're one of these people. I I, I don't gather. For <laughs> Alice Clark, yeah, yeah, it's Fred Mackham, yeah, Alice Clark. Cheers. Sorry. There you go. Cleaner. A, a, a first <laughs> hand example. Exactly. Uh, you, you know, for a lot of people there, and this is not a disparaging comment because it's an aspect of personality, but for a lot of people, their music taste kind of freezes at the age of 16, 17. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy not being one of those people, or at least, you know, I, li- I like exploring all my music, but I find that there's entire like genres where I discover, and I think, why wasn't I listening to this back when? I don't know why it's important, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think also how, how how music is made now is probably so different to back then anyway that all, you have all these weird genres. I think yes. when I think back to, to sort of like the 2000s, you know, you had you had artists like, um, like Aphex Twin and stuff, yeah. but, and, and they were doing similar stuff to what John Hopkins and things like that doing now, but I was just never interested. But yeah. nowadays, it's like, oh yeah, wicked, like, Aphex Twins mind-blowing sometimes. I remember listening to uh, some Aphex Twin with one of my mates when we were under the influence. And uh, and he's just he goes, the guy just doesn't loop. The, <laughs> no, no two bars are the same. It's crazy, it's crazy. Have you uh, listened to, um, what is it, Cocktail part, Party Effects or something like that? No, no, yeah, you have to... Cocktail what, Party Effects. What is this Aphex Twin? Nelson. No, no, no. But it's just like a really, it's just really weird fucking music. It's, yeah. I, but it's great. I love it. It's great. There, uh, there's also a really cool venue here called Funk House. Um, and they had this uh, installation called Monom. And it was yeah. this sort of like 3D sound system. Yeah. Um, and you could like, I guess it was kind of like this whole like ELM, what it, like electronic listening music type yeah. thing. Yeah. And I went there one night and uh it was pretty surreal and I, I led down on the floor because, you know, this is like Berlin, this is the type of weird shit that you do. Really? And I led down on, on the floor and I thought, yeah, this is okay and cool and whatever. But then I found out later that actually you shouldn't really lie down on the floor. You should like walk around because the more you walk around, it's basically like 16 different, um, I think it's 16 um, stacks of sort of like speakers. Yes. And you can walk around and every single speaker has like a different sound coming from it. And and so if you lie down, you're getting like a 16th of the experience. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. I th- I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 16 speakers, but it's all this like 4D weird sound shit, binaural processing. Yeah. Edit. No, that sounds, uh, that, that sounds that sound like the place to be. So hey, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one more question and I'm happy we haven't covered this yet because... Uh, it's kind of well. It's just dominated conversation for the last ten years. It feels like. But uh, how is the? What's the mood over there like regarding COVID? Because I think one thing we have not yet realized is that every country's experience of COVID is unique, and we imagine that how we feel about it and how we've experienced it translates to everyone. But it just doesn't. So you know, not everyone has furlough. Not everyone yeah. has tiers, tier one, two, three, etc. What's it like over there? Uh, I mean, we're on lockdown now until mid Feb. Mm-hmm. Um, schools are closed. Um, I think parents and yeah, parents especially are start, starting to feel a bit tired by okay. now. Um, yeah. So that's the same. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's the thing. Um, I think everyone's 
everyone's just a bit a bit tired of of this now, but we, we're we're quite socially sort of like aware that yeah. if if we go through the motions now and sort of like stay locked down, um, then it will help later on, you know. Um, so go through the pain now rather than you know for the next four years have a lockdown every six months. Yes. Um, so it's a bit more. We're all in it together still. Yeah. Um, it's a bit different compared to the UK. I really had the sense that when I was back at Christmas, that everybody was sort of like really fed up of COVID. Like yeah. really, really fed up. And um, people weren't adhering to, to things like masks and yeah. stuff like that. Here it's, you know, like we got told the other day that now we have to wear um, surgical masks whenever we go on uh, public transport or in shops. We've had mandatory masks and face coverings since since very early on last year, maybe in like, I don't know, yes. April or something. But it's the, it's, the, it's the type of mask. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So now it's changed to like surgical and specific ones that, that we can wear yeah. um, for those things. So but Those are really cool. Did you see that thing Dave Dye shared? It was like, he was he did a blog post like, why do people not do product demo advertising anymore? Yeah. Uh, this would have worked for COVID. And so there was this kid trying to blow out, you know, a lighter, cigarette lighter, through yeah. various types of fabric and through the surgical masks, it just couldn't make a dint. It didn't even move. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny. That, was that was that was that the, was that a kid? Because yes. I definitely saw I saw one where it was like an American, and it, it was this famous guy. Well, I say famous. He's a viral guy. Yeah. Uh, and and it was his first video in like two years or something. And he did the exact same thing. He had like this this like fake. Uh, he had this fake head with a mask on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he had like an aerosol with a lighter and was doing like flamethrower type things. Uh, and yeah, it was just crazy to see that like, you know, he, he was setting off this fire and the mask just like, it just really just helped stop like any sort of like aerosol go, go through basically. Amazing. Was, I don't know. I don't know. I'll send you the link anyway, but it's, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll it's throw pretty, it up on it's pretty, It's pretty wild. It's pretty yeah, wild. So. But I'm kind of glad to hear that even, you know, even in Germany, I, it's an odd thing to be glad about, but I'm happy to hear that there's even a bit of a mood of weariness with it over there because over here, especially on the liberal side of things, and, you know, I count myself as a, a liberal, mo- people are kind of wor- hero-worshipping Germany as, like, the best country in the world who do everything perfectly and everyone's a, a superman. Yeah. Or, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's co- I guess it's comforting to know that it's not only us who are getting weary of it, but I do feel like we have not had the same quality of, like, moral leadership that you have in Germany. And I don't mean that like, again, hero worshipping. I just mean, I think uh, Angela Merkel in particular is not as, um, is 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 better at giving bad news to people than Boris Johnson is. I think Boris Johnson thrives on giving good news. I think it's also, you know, the plan, like there's a plan. Yes. And they stick to it. Like, yes. That's... Whereas we change ours every three months. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, like, um, I read before that now back in the UK that the, the R rate. I mean, this has probably changed by the time this goes out. But yeah, R, it's back up to R four because we all went out. <laughs> <laughs> the R rate is now under under one, and yes. they we're talking ages back that if it goes underneath one, then there's like like we can lessen some things. And you just think, no, this is like this is not a good idea. Like, stick to the plan. Yeah, stop promising more than you yeah. can deliver. Stop trying yeah. to keep people happy. That's why I. Um... I put uh, my favorite Lord, well, not my favorite, but for the last year, it's been popping into my head every few minutes. It's a few, let's say, a few days. Lord, favorite clip from Lord of the Rings where um, Gandalf assumes control of Gondor because uh, the, the steward of Gondor, what's he called, Denethor, uh, yeah. just decides to abandon ship and says, fuck it, we're not going to win this war. Everyone leave. <laughs> and so Gandalf just, uh, you know, whacks him around the head and, and just tells everyone to get ready for, for war. And I think that's what we've needed. I feel like you kind of have that over there a bit better than we do. Yeah. I mean, I, look, the, the world's weird. Everything's changing now. We've got a new president in the US. Yeah. Um, you know, we have this sort of thing that's happening in Italy where the, the government like <laughs> basically survived the other day. So that's happening. Survived. Um, yeah. Yeah, did you not hear about this? No, no, we, we we just get COVID and Joe Biden news at the okay. moment, but your yeah, girlfriend's yeah, yeah. Italian. Tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So so Conti faced um, a vote of no confidence. Wow. Um, and yeah, because basically his his coalition partner left uh, <laughs> for whatever reason. So so that happens. Um, and then, you know, in the UK, you've got COVID and then you've got Brexit. So there's going to be so much, so so many changes over the next year. Yeah. Um, 
and you know we've just got to do got to got to do the best really that, that we can do yeah and have a bit of fun whenever we can and try new things and yeah do yeah. wonderful things are you are you do you i mean I'm asking another normal person like me, not a medical expert. So, you know, disclaimer. But are you confident that we'll be seeing something akin to normality before the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely hope there's something there. But I'm also a bit, a bit weird about, like, no, normality. Because, you know, I think it's also been re- really good to see how things still work, even, even when everybody has to stay at home and what it means for for everything in the future, you know, like... Yeah, we've um, had the test of human adaptability that we've not had in the West, we've not had to do for about 70 years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think I think there's some some th- thoughts there about like, you know, where do we want to go um, and what do we want to make normal? Because I don't, I don't think, personally, I don't think getting up and going into an office five days a week is probably that normal, actually. I think, you know, if you split it to, you know, maybe three days in, two days out or whatever, uh, I think that's going to be more productive. It's it's quite interesting that the creative side of things in in the UK, especially, you know, the ideas happen in pubs and in bars. And yes, away from desks, and uh, it's it's a bit more different here. People right. tend to still stay in um, the environment that that we're in. So, like an office, we work in work, and we play out of work. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just something. It's so it's it is a thing. Um, I mean, I don't really encourage anybody to to be work here. out of work if, if they don't need to. Like, if they don't need to be in a room, then don't be in a room. Um, yeah, in this building really. So, so it's, it's it's how it goes. I mean, we're all working from home anyway. Um, mm. I just came in because my internet is so bad. Yeah, um, at home and, it, and it's a bit, and it's a good backdrop, and you don't have to uh, you know <laughs> exactly, you don't have to exactly. explain it. But exactly. uh, I know what you mean though, and uh, to our to our the generation of our children, it will seem weird. And you know, kids kids who are born now will have grown up with social media, uh, so. Yeah. Pre-social media will seem not abnormal as a life before, I don't know, TV and music does to us. Yeah, yeah. And to, you know, whoever, our children's generation, they might find it weird that at one point you all had to go into the same room to do the task. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just wild, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, you know, like even things like presentations and pitching, things like that, like, I, I don't know, I mean, it's always good to be able to speak to people in person, but, you know, you realize now that maybe we don't need to go on a two-hour flight to wherever. Yes, um, I, I do pitch. hope that it's curbed the worst kind of excesses. I do yeah, hope it's trimmed those exactly. things off. And I, I, think, I think that's what, I'm, what I'm, I'm interested in. It's not so much like how soon can we get back to normal and where we're all jet-setting and being blah, 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 blah. It's more about like, you know, what can we take from this that will actually improve the world, our lives, um and that's i think is a bit more important um you know i think it gives us a lot of chance as well just to to, to mess around with new with new things like i've started doing painting i did sketching yeah. last year yeah uh sourdough i started doing as well yeah. and you know like without this I, I wouldn't have done any of that shit at yeah. all so uh yeah it's interesting hey well we'll do another one sometime where we talk about sourdough because i had my sourdough moment. Well, I, I had my own version of lockdown from the age of 24 to 26 because I was just so broke and back living with my parents that yeah. couldn't go out and do anything ever. So, uh, same, so I, d- I did that one, so don't worry. It's yeah, we've all done it. But yeah. for some reason, I chose to do sourdough during that era. <laughs> so I'll find you on Instagram and I'll send you my ultimate sourdough. I'm very that proud sounds of it. Yeah, sounds good. That sounds good. So, um, hey, this is a good place to wrap it up. So I'm going to um, stop the recording there. 